Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Highland Park Public Library, I'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We are pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini series about books, culture, and what to read next. I'm Sarah Marie, and this is your Information and Reader Services Department. In this episode, we are excited to share with you what we have been reading, watching, and are listening to during Shelf Isolation. To begin a mini series, I'm going to turn things over to Reader's Roundtable expert and moderator, Michelle. Thanks, Sarah Marie. So the first thing that I've read this week was called The Art of Happy Moving, How to Declutter, Pack, and Start Over While Maintaining Your Sanity and Finding Happiness. And then this is by Ellie Wensky, who actually created this book from her blog. And it's pretty much, she says that every time you move, you have a chance to start over. And this is a really great guide on how to, the steps you can take to make your move the best. I feel like this particular book maybe didn't fit my particular needs, but it's really great for somebody who um, has a family and um, you're moving like across country but it talks about how to stage your home and how to organize and pack your belongings and how to say goodbye to people and how to start your own life. I would definitely check out the blog. It's full of really fantastic um, resources, including checklists that you can print out um, that will really make your move really helpful. Um, next, I read Disappearing Earth by Julia Phillips, which we have talked about before. It takes place in the northeastern edge of Russia. Two sisters are abducted. And then in the following months, it's following uh, points of view of many women that live in the area and how they were affected by these girls being kidnapped. Um, it's a really great book. And I want to plug that it will be the first book in the fall series for Judy Levin, um, which takes place on September 8th, which is a Tuesday from 1 to 2.30. It'll be at, on Zoom, and you can register today through our calendar. We hope that we will see you there. And that's all I have to talk about this week, so I'm going to turn it over to Catherine. Thanks, Michelle. This week, I'm continuing to read Old in Art School and enjoying it. I won't talk about it too much because I talked about it last week, but we are having a discussion of it online on August 14th. And as Michelle mentioned about the Judy Levin series, you can also sign up for this book discussion on our calendar. And you'll get a link about the day before that will give you the link to participate in that. This week, I finished listening to the audiobook Farsighted, How We Make the Decisions That Matter Most by Stephen Johnson. The title pretty much says it all. It's about decision making. And the focus here is on big long-term decision making. He uses examples from military history, but also making big decisions in your own life. It is a book that goes pretty much as I expected it to go, but then towards the end, one of the techniques that he talks about is the novel as a technology that humans have developed for imagining scenarios from different points of view. And he had covered earlier in the book how diverse points of view really aid in making correct decisions, or maybe not correct decisions, but good decisions. This is the only book that I've read in what I'd call the self-optimization genre that recommends reading Middlemarch. So I just second that endorsement. Farsighted, the audiobook is a good one for in the car, if you're going on a road trip, which I keep mentioning because some people do that in the summer, or just commuting back and forth to work like I've been doing. And that's all I finished this week, so I will pass it on to Jackie. Thank you, Catherine. So this week, I finished the third book of March, which I talked about last week, which was part of the March trilogy by John Lewis. And once again, it's a wonderful, wonderful graphic novel. I also read the book Yale Needs Women by Anne Gardner Perkins. Anne was a Yale grad from 81 and when she went to write her dissertation for PhD at the University of Massachusetts she decided to focus on the women Yale, the first graduating class, and she was very surprised to find that the research she came up with there were no books that actually included the voice of those women who attended the school. So she decided to interview some of those 
first women in school. So Yale was established in 1701, and they finally allowed women undergraduates in 1969. So for 268 years, they were pretty much all male. And she described it as a village of men in her introduction. Now, interestingly enough, the graduate school and the professional school allowed women starting in 1968. And those women included Janet Yellen, who was a former Fed chair, and Hillary Rodden Sutton. So it was very gradually done. The president of the university, Kingman Brewster, did not want women to join. He was a product of the uh, all-male prep school and of Yale itself. Yet he was very an advocate for um, African-American increasing their student population. So it kind of was interesting, the difference in it. So Ann Perkins decided to interview these women. So she interviewed 42 of the first female undergraduates. Her book focused on five of them in particular, and two were African-American, three were white, and it was a very interesting thing. But, you know, when you think about 1969, you had a lot of unrest in the country. You still had Vietnam War um, protests. You had um, civil rights protests. You had um, women themselves trying to liberate themselves. So it was an interesting time period when Yale actually had co-education with the women. And it actually was the male student body, particularly the editor of the um, Yale paper was very adamant that they should do it. And Kingman Young was not really that crazy about it, but they did integrate very quickly. But the women were in, the way I viewed it, were, I think, kind of the Mrs. School. The men really weren't interested in having them in class, they wanted to socialize with them. And one woman actually said that whenever she would raise her hand to speak in class, the male students in the room would turn around and stare at her as if she furniture itself offered an opinion. So it's a very interesting book um, discussing this time period. So it, if you're interested in that, you probably would like it. The other book I read, and I actually read this last year, but I thought I'd talk about it today because for those of you who may be interested in true crime but don't want to read a bloody gory true crime novel, you may want to try The Feather Thief. And The Feather Thief is about a young man, Edmund Just, who was a genius. He was a talented flautist who, as a 20-year-old, was attending the Royal Academy of Music. And one evening in June of 2009, he boarded a train after a concert he gave at the Academy, headed to the British Museum of Natural History, and sold hundreds of rare specimens for the birds. And why did he do this? Well, he had an obsession with salmon fly tying, the Victorian artist salmon fly tying, and he wanted to use the actual feathers that were used by those Victorian fly tires. It's a very interesting look at how someone can be obsessed and how this obsession is overriding any type of law-abiding citizenship, if you want to call it that. It also is an interesting look at how fashion created a dearth of these birds because they basically killed them off so they can wear feathers in their hats and everything. So if you're interested in a true crime story that doesn't have blood and gore and has some psychological information in it, try to feather feet. And that's pretty much all I have for this week. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Jackie. So I'll start with a recommendation from my toddler. This is Eat Peach Pear Plum by Janet and Alan Alberg. Somehow I was not familiar with this from my own childhood, though I recognized the illustrators. They did The Jolly Postman, which I loved as a kid. But this is very short and sweet and rhyming and is a very easy I spy book. So each page has something for the child to look for. So I spy Tom Thumb, find him in the trees. <laughs> and my toddler loves it. He can find all the things now. So we've been reading this a lot. So that's each peach pear plum. And then what I've been reading, I finished The Last House Guest by Megan Miranda, which is a Beach Read Thriller. It was a Hello Sunshine Reese Witherspoon's book club pick, I believe last summer, and is the story of a town in Maine where most of the people who 
visit are the tourists who come for the summer and then there are the locals. That's a theme that comes up a lot in this kind of book. Um, and Avery, the main character, her best friend was died the summer before. We don't know if she drowned or if she was murdered. And so Avery is trying to figure out what happened to her best friend who was Avery is a local. Her best friend is an out-of-towner. I was pretty suspenseful. I listened to it on audio and got through it really quickly because I wanted to know what happened. So Megan Miranda, the author, does have a new book out this summer, The Girls of Widow Hill, but I still have that one on hold, so I'm waiting. But if you're looking for a sort of escapist beach read thriller, I really enjoyed this one. But the other book I read this week might be my favorite so far this year, which was The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue. So this, some people probably won't want to read this right now. It is set during the 1918 influenza epidemic in a Dublin maternity, Dublin hospital maternity ward. The main character is a nurse and it takes place over like three days of her shifts at the maternity ward. It's almost stream of consciousness, really suspenseful, all from her perspective. And I read the author's note at the end. The author had just finished the draft, the first draft in March of this year and submitted it to her editors and then all the COVID stuff happened. So they worked really hard to get it out quickly. And it was just published, I believe last week, July 20th. And so I really, really enjoyed this. The audio was eight hours, so it's not a very big book. The print's only about 300 pages. So I highly recommend that. And with that, I will pass it on to Sarah Marie. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Shelf Isolation has really just made me realize that you and I have similar reading tastes because I recommend, I second both Emma Donahue and Megan Miranda. So this week, I am going to recommend something that I have been kind of reading more and more of during quarantine, which are cookbooks. So I have been reading a lot of cookbooks, mostly because I have also been cooking at home more frequently, as probably we all have, but also because we have been doing the Cooking with Books book club, which meets every other Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. The next meeting is August 11th. They are cooking out of the Cozy Evanston Cookbook for Uncertain Times, Mastering the Art of Quarantine Cooking, which was compiled by friends and neighbors of the Evanston Public Library, and it's available online. So most of the cookbooks that I have been paging through have actually been online, but now that we're here back at the library, I can pick up a few of my favorites, one of which is the, I know it's a cheat, but One Pot Martha Stewart cookbook. There's a lot of great pages. She has a lot of instructions that are very easy to follow. And again, these are all going to be, you cook it everything in one pan. The other book that I really have enjoyed and have liked having physically is Chrissy Teigen's Cravings which is also just beautifully done. I follow her on Twitter, she's hysterical, and she keeps giving more stuff. The last cookbook I want to recommend is something that one of my really good friends sent me as a gift most recently. They had been hearing a lot about it and they were like, oh, I know exactly who I want to share this with. And they sent me The Elder Scrolls Official Cookbook by Chelsea Monroe Kessel. And so this cookbook is based off of a video game. Do not let that fool you, though. The book is amazing. I stopped actually bookmarking pages as I was going through it because I realized that I wanted to cook every recipe, so I was bookmarking every page. It is so well published. Each recipe, I think there are basically just five steps to it. I think the longest one was seven, and that was for a chicken pot pie, which I will needless to say be making in the fall. And it just is so well published. There are photos for each step. It's so well written. And I just encourage all of you to, even after quarantine and once we can all get food out again, just pay more attention to cookbooks. I really have enjoyed my time with them so far. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to William. Thank you, Sarah Marie. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a game this week, a new indie release called Maneater which is available for the PS4 and the Xbox One. Now, it's quite the interesting take on the action RPG. You play a baby shark, do, 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 who is seeking vengeance against the shark hunter who killed their mother and disfigured their face. 
To do so, you must wander the ocean, scavenging on various aquatic life and taking in nutrients so you can grow and evolve into a threat great enough to capture the attention of the shark hunter so you can have a final showdown. If it's not clear how tongue-in-cheek this game is, the game is narrated by an in-game reality television show host a la Discovery Shark Week. Now, I have to admit, while I'm very interested in this game, this is not actually for me. This is a going away gift for someone I know. You, on the other hand, can check this out from us as we have copies here at the library. On the subject of gifts, the next thing I want to talk about is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Now, to be perfectly honest, I read it once in high school and didn't give it much thought afterwards. This was not the case for my best friend, who has spent many of the years since then chasing around any and every sort of ad adaptation of the novel. Now, because I want to be a good friend, I try to occasionally get her gifts that speak to this in an interesting way. The first successful attempt I had at this was getting her a shirt from a company called Litographs. They create apparel, posters, blankets, and other goods with designs that use the actual full text from the book. It's a neat and clever idea, although I do hope they do a better job of promoting the items once they send them. The first of these shirts that I got her, they've come out with two for Pride and Prejudice, came with no sort of message or anything that said it was a litograph shirt. So she opened it and she said, okay, there's a shirt and it has an image on it. And then she, for whatever reason, decided to look close like, oh wait, this is actually the text of Pride and Prejudice. And we're like, yay, we all celebrate it. So the most recent gift related to this thing actually started with a suggestion from a former page here. Shout out to Fiona. She mentioned getting a purse with the Hugh Thompson cover for the novel on Etsy. And this seemed like a super easy slam dunk until I realized when I did my own search that most of the places that sold it on Let's Etsy, were, they were made of faux leather, which is something that has its own environmental concerns and issues, which is very important to my friend. And when I asked my friend kind of obliquely, hey, all things being equal, would you want something made of real leather or faux leather? How do you feel? She said, honestly, I'd probably go because of the environmental impact to actual leather and this set me on a tailspin because I couldn't find anywhere except for one place in Russia that made it out of leather. And seven weeks later, I ended up with this. So this is the purse. There you go. It's got like that there and that there. And here's my favorite part. Oh, we open it. Oh, well, that's the first page of the book. Oh, man, this thing is great. I hope she appreciates it. And with that, I'm going to pass it along to Nancy. Thank you, William. That's very thoughtful. I, I, I like the way you put so much thought and care into picking a gift out for someone. I'm sure that's appreciated. I am once again going to share my screen and talk a little bit about Ravinia. I'm happy to say that we have now published on, I guess show this us briefly, on the digital library and it shows up ida.org, Illinois Digital Archives. And if you search 1905, you'll see some things that we recently put up, and that's the second season of Ravinia. And it's a couple of programs. One interesting is a fold-out program. And it, it, Ravinia, for those of you who don't know, was built to promote use of the electric rail line, which is now a bike path. And you can see it points out here. Don't forget the winter season at Ravinia Theater. There's ice skating and tobogganing. And sadly, we don't have any pictures of that. We do have pictures of next to the toboggan run of a tree, but that's not really helpful. So I was kind of curious because this was actually mismarked. The date was marked 1920s when it was brought into the historical study in the 60s. But a couple of things indicated to me that was incorrect. And I checked out, and in fact, it's 1905. And this was not, there's also a regular program for 1905, but Emilio Rivella came with Imperial Italian Band. And during my, I'm just briefly kind of checking this out, this 1905 program, the second year of Ravinia, he was dismissed shortly after because he was not gesturing enough when he was conducting, which is kind of a stereotype, and you don't have to gesture a lot to be a conductor, but he still had a very successful music career. And the, the um, programs from 1905 were very poppy, not terribly surprising. And also, in addition to the regular season and these pop concerts by an Italian band, Italian musicians, 
they were all Italian musicians and um, all very good musicians. They had from the Austro-Hungarian Empire a boys' choir come at the end of the, the summer. And I don't think these, a lot of these programs survive. So it's, it's unique, something that we have out to share with people. If you find you're interested in a lot of these little opera ditties, little opera shorts, on Hoopla, there are various selections you can pick out. There's like classic operas, which is a selection of different operas, like they would play at these early Ravinia concerts. I didn't check it out. It's not my style of listening, but that's something that you can think about. Of Hoopla, if you want to hear a selection of these various operas, and say, oh, what was that sound like? What was that program? You can check that out from Hoopla. And with that, I will say thank you and pass it over to Lori. Thanks, Nancy. So I just wanted to point out that Nancy's research, all the things she's been talking about that have been digitized about Ravinia are part of an Illinois Secretary of State grant that she got. She and the library and Ravinia to get their archives together and online. And they were supposed to have um, an in-person event to showcase the collection, but Nancy did a nice pivot, and that's one of the reasons that she's been um, showcasing them on shelf isolation. So thanks, Nancy. They've been really interesting, and anyone can look through them now. So this week, I read a book called Queenie Malone's Paradise Hotel by Ruth Hogan. Ruth Hogan wrote another book called The Keeper of Lost Things, which I, I have this recollection that I read it but I think I have to go get it again and reread it because I can't remember how exactly it ended. So it's the story of a child named Tilly who grows up to be a young woman named Tilda. And as Tilda, she comes back to Brighton. It takes place in England to take care of her mother's estate. She moves back into her mother's flat. And it's told through the perspective of the adult Tilda and the child Tilly who had kind of a, a very fraught childhood and then a very happy interlude that abruptly ended when she was sent to boarding school and how as an adult she comes back to Brighton and she's trying to reconcile everything that happened and she does in a kind of a bittersweet way and I, I recommend it. It was, it was an interesting group of people, some really interesting twists. I enjoyed it. So that's my book for the week. Queenie Malone's Paradise Hotel. And now I am going to pass it back to Sarah Marie. Okay, that is it for us today, folks. As always, please remember that we are all here for you. We are available for any comments, questions, or concerns you may have. And you can reach us online through Facebook at facebook.com slash hplibrary, through our Twitter, which is at hplibrary, or via email, which is hppla at hplibrary. We're also now here in person via reservation. You can learn more about this on our website, which is hplibrary.org. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod. You can find more information about this, the titles we mentioned, and the events we mentioned in the show notes below. Okay, everybody, this is us signing off. Until we see you next, stay safe. <laughs> <laughs>